So today I don't have a presentation. It's week 18 of our Get Started Tool with OpenSea's in STKO series. We are talking about RC structure. So I just have four examples of an RC structure with some different things added to it. What I'm gonna do is explain to you how I made the changes and maybe go a bit more into detail on what is used for what. Um, and some, let's say, additional also tips that I also discovered has, as I was doing it. So yeah, I hope that will be helpful. And we don't, we don't have a presentation, so we just have some models for you to, to see. So we start with a different, this time I changed my frame structure. I was bored from the one of before. This is a bit isometric. It's still modeling Newton millimeters. Um, I have columns and beams both with fiber section, so distributed plasticity. And in this case, I wanted to give you an example on how to model a flexible diaphragm and not a rigid diaphragm. We already discussed how to create a rigid diaphragm. Now, I wanted to just show you how you can insert a flexible diaphragm. I did not um, create a nonlinear material for the flexible diaphragm. That's something that if you want to do, you can do. Uh, but just I, I just created an elastic membrane plate section with a specific stiffness, a Poisson ratio, and then just uh, a thickness to create the stiffness of the section. So let's say in this case, this makes sense to be, to be done if you don't have, uh, for example, a concrete a slab, but you have a slab of an existing building that is uh, maybe made like a long time ago and you cannot really account for its rigidity. Uh, when you model the building. But the thing is that uh, if you want to see the inflection in this kind of model, you will need to mesh it a lot because there's no way that with, with one element, you will be able to see any uh, displacement in the, even for gravity analysis in the center of any of these, of these phases. So what I did was model the three floors, one, let's say all equal to, to each other, apart from the top floor. And I added a node at the top because I wanted to do a push over analysis. And I will tell you later why this is not really the right way to do it for this kind of model, because I encountered some differences in the result that I did not expect, but I should have accounted for the fact that I was applying um, a concentrated force in a shell. So in a, not in a shell, in a, in a, in a phase. So in an elastic memory phase section, and it was a localized effect that I should have accounted for. So let's say our, um, as always, our geometries are all merged, are all together. Uh, we don't have any interaction. We have a linear ramp for applying our, our loads. We define the concrete zero two with some tensile strength and still with some hardening, very low hardening. Be careful with this value. I've seen a lot of models with very high hardening, like 0.1, 0 0.2. Hola, Maria. Is it Maria? I don't know. Could you turn off your mic, please? OK. Um, so I've seen a lot of models in also in the forum, and I also find it sometimes to just carelessly putting 0 0.1 here, but just for you to remember, like hardening, very, very, sorry, very, very high hardening can create problems in our, in, in the numerical um, solution, because it will tend to infinity if we choose a number that is too high and it will be hard for, for the solver to find convergence. So do not put this too, too high. I think I had this kind of number. Okay. Then, um, so this material I did not use, but it was just uh, something for you to see how um, how you can apply it. So if you want to use uh, to apply an initial stress to, uh, for example, uh, a pre-compressed um, concrete section, what you do is you define this uniaxial material called init stress material. You define the value of the stress that you want in the same units that you are, are modeling everything else. And then you reference the material that you want to pre-stress. 
So that material that can then be referenced inside of the, sorry, of the, of the section. So here you could have just like picked the pre-stress as a material and then your section would have been pre-stressed, but we didn't do it here. So uh, I think I didn't do it here. I hope this, I didn't mean to. I did it, okay, let's take it away because we don't want this effect. I mean, this is not really something that you see in this kind of structure. And this is for like large bridges or uh, buildings with very large um, distance in between supports and stuff like that. Uh, so we apply the column to the columns and the beams uh, to all the beams. And also here I assigned a section offset to align my, my beams with the slab level. And then we have the slab physical property. We just need two elements, one for the, for the beams and columns and one for the slabs. Just remember if you use a quadrilateral element, you need to mesh your model with a structure mesh. As you can see, this is structure with a quadrilateral topology. Otherwise you will not obtain, uh, you will obtain an error that's telling you my element wants a certain number of nodes instead the element that you're giving me actually has a different number of nodes. So as boundary condition, we fix the base of this model. As always, we apply self-weight to the columns, to the beams, and to the slab. So one thing that's really, really easy to use in, in the sense that that's really um, convenient to have if you're doing a, a 3D frame model of an RC structure is to have this kind of slab to redistribute your load. Because of course, otherwise you will have to do a lot of calculations to reapply the load that's on the slabs on each of the edges. And that changes based on the, if the beam is internal or external. I mean, any, any, in any way that you decide to divide the area of influence of each of the beams. So I would, especially if this is a bidirectional slab. Uh, so I would say that this is very useful and can be done even if you are not using uh, an elastic membrane plate section. We already discussed this. Like you don't have to, uh, you can have faces without applying any element to them. And using surface load, you can redistribute the load uh, without having to uh, to use the the faces as any element in your in your model. You can even use the rigid diaphragm together with the faces. We saw we saw that I think in week three already. The only thing is that if you want to use the surface load, I just, I repeat this again, uh, you need to uh, have only quadrilateral faces always. Because if you have, for example, a beam just in one of these fields uh, of the structure and, and it just ends here, you will need to cut the rest of the mesh manually. So to have compatibility of the mesh and obtain only quadrilateral elements. Then moving forward, we have, we apply, I apply live load, that load different from like in, in the first two levels and the top level. And then I apply the horizontal force here in the top node um, to push my structure. There was another load. Well, wow. a lot of mistakes in this model. Okay, then we create a recorder. What are we interested in? Initially, I wanted to do an again value analysis, but I did not. So we don't need this. We need displacement rotation, reaction force, and reaction moment. We want to see local forces in this model, uh, deformation, section for section deformation, and fibers, stress and strain to see the results on the fibers of the columns. I, I can add my fix and, and my. Here, there was like this because in another model, there is a rigid diaphragm instead of the shells. We are checking them all together, guys. And then I add my self-weight and I can use a factor here. We already discussed how to make load combinations. In this case, I didn't do it. I just added them all in the second step, but you can use, for example, the live load and do a different factor and then do a separate analysis. And this is like, you can use the same patterns in the same block of analysis steps, like right before one single analysis step, if you are not interested in making any combination or any envelope, but you just want to add uh, the different pattern with different factors. 
But if you want to see them in an envelope, then you need different analysis steps. I created a gravity analysis. In this case, we don't need, we can use the transformation, which is the most convenient constraint handler if we don't have any specific uh, constraint uh, conditions. Uh, just a load control analysis with some steps. And the same goes for the analysis before. They are just the same analysis, okay? Then I create uh, an horizontal load uh, pattern in which I add my horizontal force and try to monitor the result. So I go here, I give my monitor a meaningful name. I add results in the X in the Y direction with two of the selection set that I created beforehand. And I apply here a factor. In fact, on my Y axis, I will have kilonewtons and not newtons. I add a static analysis for my horizontal analysis using a displacement control controlling the top node to move in the X direction, which is the one with the most, let's say, asymmetry, because I want to see what's happening in that direction. I did some tests. I have to admit, like here, you don't really know this number yet. Most of the times, if you're doing uh, an application, even with an existing building, you don't know how much it can reach. So what I suggest is that first you, you, you aim very high <laughs> and with very uh, a little amount of increment, and you see what happens. Because at the beginning, I started with one meter. I want to move it a lot. And then I'm going to see what's, when, when my analysis will stop. And then given that I wanted to um, compare this with other models, I had to use a set number of increments uh, so that I could, like, um, mm, let's say, how, how do you say, um, synchronize the results all together. So let's see how this analysis run. There's a lot, a lot of elements. And so one thing that you could have done, that I could have done was to run it in parallel. It will take a long time for him to start even the gravity analysis because of the high number of elements. And then it will go forward. So as, as it runs, because I want to see if after these little changes I did, the results are changing, given that I had made some mistakes. I will show you the second example, how I was setting it up. So we are in the same model, exactly. The only difference between this model and the next is the presence of truss elements to mimic the presence of infill. I just put them in the outside uh, walls in the X direction, because that's where I was gonna do my pushover. And it was along, like, let's say, a long um, effort to do it everywhere. But just for you to show how is it that you model this kind of infill. So I don't know if you can see here, when I mesh, everything is um, much subdivided, by, but the infill is not. That's because we're using a truss element. Truss elements have to be monodimensional, otherwise they do not work. And also in between, if you want to, let's say, model an infill, uh, which works in both direction. You need two truss elements because they only work in compression. And, mm, and so you need to have one in one direction and one in the other direction. In this case, I could have just kept uh, this one because I was pushing in that direction, but then um, I would have had to apply, let's say the stiffness of both to one. Anyway, the, the way you, you model this is when you already have your, let's say your frame, and this frame is a wire, you can add the truss elements with lines, but do not merge them. Because if you do merge them, this will happen. The central node will be created, and we do not want that. So the way to avoid it is to create a wire. After you've done this, you can go on and operate a merging operation with other type of geometries, like a face, for example. But merging these two will not create a node where I previously did not create it. So you can go forward from, from this way without having to, let's say, uh, do some kind of tricks or uh, create interactions between the truss and the wire. You, need, you can just use the, the, the make wire command before you merge with everything else. So just for you to remember. 
And what did we add in this model? So to add, I created an infill material. So to how, how to calibrate this? It's, a, it's quite complicated. To be honest, this is just an example. So these are just, let's say, a very low resistance of, uh, uh, of what I can imagine can be like a, uh, I don't know, a, a masonry wall with hollow blocks or anything else that could be an infill frame in, an, in a frame. But to do this, you just have to look up the sensor literature. I don't have any references for you today, but I can look them up. What is important that when you use a special purpose truss, you also have to define a reference section. So you define a section that simulates the stiffness of your wall, uh, and then you reference the material that you previously defined with a, a type of truss. Or if you want to define an elastic section, uh, without, let's say, a nonlinear material, you can just use truss section and then reference a section, not a material here. So in this case, I referenced uh, an elastic section here with a nonlinear material. This is just for me to have the shape. It's not an elastic section. It's not an elastic material. It's nonlinear, but it has, uh, I'm using the elastic section beam editor to, to create the, the section itself. And what you do, you apply this to the newly added trusses. Later on, um, you apply a truss element to the same element. And this is the only difference between the two models. Welcome, newcomers. Oh. Hi, please. I'm going to mute you. Thanks. Um, so this is what you will see. Uh, I know it's a, it looks not very nice. <laughs> But uh, this is, I also did not apply my very cute uh, transparency to the shader to make my model nice. So I will do it now with you. This is how I, I trick a sticky to make them look a little better. Much cuter. OK, so. Um, so what I obtained with these two models before without correcting the, the mistakes, I will show you now on my other computer. This was the pushover uh, without the infill, and this was the pushover with the infill. As you can see, the nice did not reach, um, let's say, a positive behavior. But we can see that with the infill, I reached my uh, uh, capacity at a lower level of displacement. So I, I can imagine that this analysis will go forward and my structure would be more stiff to the lateral force. So this is something that I obtained. And also I can show you here. Uh, these are the other two models that I'll show you later on. Let me just plot these two. This is also a trick that you can use to to show more models in one post processor, just move them around in your space and they will be loaded exactly in the same position. So let's say I want to see here, for example, if you want to synchronize the two models, as you can see here, my analysis, the one of the infill, which is the second one here, after certain steps, it disappears because I didn't reach that step in the analysis. Anyways, as, as you may be able to see from the top, with the infill, my model moves a little less. And also there's less uh, torsional behavior. Okay, what happens though, what I mentioned before about the localized effect is that in terms of stress, if I go um, here, if I go here and I have a long plot and I plot the stresses section, no, the, st the section force, what did I want to get? Section force, this one, exactly. And this one. So principal forces, as you can see, something is happening here and here too. So I would suggest if you want to do a pushover analysis with an RC frame structure, with like flexible diaphragms, you, if you want to see um, 
some deformation, displacement in the z direction at, let's say, the last step, you will need to mesh your structure. But if you want to do a lateral analysis, do not apply the force in one point. In this case, you have a whole side of the structure that you can use to, for the application. Um, so do use a different kind of load application. You can still normalize the, the load you're applying to one and using the displacement control so that you will see uh, your load multiplier has, uh, sorry, you can see the time steps to be has the load multiplier of your, of your analysis, but then try to avoid these kind of problems like localized effects because they will also uh, um, descale all your results in terms of stress. For example, here, these are the two other examples that I have without the flexible diaphragm. So with the rigid diaphragms, and as you can see, I can already see stresses on my fibers in the columns and in my hinges, not hinges, let's say, joints, connection joints in between the beams and columns. And here I cannot see anything and they are on the same step. This is because everything is happening here and nothing is getting transferred to the other elements. So going back to my first model, let's see if something changed. Not much changed. This is, I stopped. We will have to investigate that. But anyway, you got the point. So uh, whenever you, uh, you want to model flexible diaphragms, do be, be careful about these two things, mesh type and application of the lateral load. So just to show you the differences between the rest, uh, this was a model just made with rigid diaphragm. What you need to add in this case, you do not have any um, truss elements here. You just have three rigid diaphragms. I had something that I did not expect happening to me as I modeled this. Given that, let's say the center uh, of the slabs is not in the same place. If I model this, diaphragms all together as one single interaction. Let's say let's remove them and do them from scratch. They would have found some of the slave nodes of the retained nodes would have found to be closer to nodes that are not belonging to their structure. This is just because the nodes are not aligned vertically. And, and so let's say that the way that the review diaphragm, the, the interaction command, not to know the interaction command is built in STKO can work in that automatism that it gives you, you can create the same interaction for all diaphragms, but only if the, if the constraint nodes, the master nodes are aligned with each other. So do not do this in this case. So going back, bringing back my model, yeah. So the only conditions that we have here, we don't have a mesh because we don't need to mesh because we don't need to see the inflections in our shells, in our, in our slabs. And we have a rigid diaphragm condition. So we need to fix the master nodes. How do you fix the master nodes? You fix them in the, um, displacement in the out of plane direction. So we don't want the diaphragm to move uh, up and down and also the rotation opposed to that direction. So we don't want the diaphragm to do like this and this. We want it to remain in the plane. And this is how you do it just to, for you to remember very easily out of plane and opposite rotations. In this case, I just wanted to show you how much, how many hedge force um, conditions I have to add to account for all of that that I created before. And this was just combining live dead and additional dead load. So if I had to separate and do a combination analysis, I would have to have three times the same amount of conditions. Of course, you can create a script to do that. Um, it's just for you to understand how fast it can be to create some slabs to apply your loads. Uh, that's it. Then just don't forget to add your MP condition of average diaphragm here. And this was the results that I obtained. Let me show you. Ah, this, I don't know if you know, if you double click on the bat file of a monitor, you will be able to see back the, the curve that you obtained before. So this is the result I obtained. 
uh, you can see that um, I obtained a lower value of uh, ultimate uh, shear force. So probably uh, the, the, there's the stiffness that I gave to the slabs. Anyway, it's uh, helping uh, the structures to sustain a larger lateral load. Or we can also account for the fact that there was localization. And so the structure was not actually uh, receiving as much lateral force as I, I was planning to apply to it. The last, last model I'm going to show you today is the same exact model as this one, but just with the application of automatic joints. So to account for um, shear capacity of RC joints, uh, before the, the development of this automatism called RC joint model 3D, then it was necessary to create four nodes in each of the, of the joints. One node that had a specific um, zero length material applied that would account for its shear capacity, and then uh, interaction that would attach that zero length to the rest of the beams and, and column. Uh, this was just to be able to also be able to create a, let's say a gap in between the joint and the, and the other elements. Because of course, to model uh, joint strain capacity, you have to give it a physical length. So not, it's not like a plastic in length, it's a physical length. So there is this automatism that was developed. It's quite um, challenging to calibrate the material properties again. So this I did following one reference that I can give you. Uh, I have it here. Nope. Downloads in my desktop. So here, um, you can find all the analytical formulation to calculate the points of, let's say, a four point backbone to model the sister model in, in a joint, either if you want to model the sleep or not. And I also have my calculations here, which I will bravely put out into the world so you guys can correct me. I wanted to just open it, not run it. Yeah. Uh, so you guys, if you, any of you actually doing these calculations by themselves of sister model or joint properties, you can look at what I did and then you can correct me if I'm wrong. And so this is how I model my joint material. So it's a pinching four material. There's four point coordinates and then there's the other coordinates. I don't know if you guys remember, we discussed this already. Are these um, F force P and U force P are factors that allow you to define these points these three points in the positive quadrant and these three points in the negative quadrant, the negative one. So there's like maximum and minimum. R is in the negative part and F is in the positive part, I think. No, sorry, P is in the positive part and N is in the negative part, exactly, that's how it works. So what you need to do to create these automatic joints is simply define this material, which it's already hard enough. Then uh, use it inside of a joint 3D model that you find here. Special purpose, I think, yeah, RC beam column joint models, RC joint model 3D. You have to assign a penalty value. And here, as always, you will need to think about what's, what's the largest stiffness in your model? What's the stiffness that you want to give to this kind of relationship? If you change this value many times, then you will see um, how the result changes. I would suggest, as always, to run a linear model, then start with a few attempts and try to make a, let's say, sensitivity analysis on the penalty value and see what is working better. And then you reference the material. If you want, you can have a different material in the x and y direction. After that, you will need to apply these joints, not to an element, not to a line, not to an edge, just to the nodes. To the same nodes, you need to apply also joint material. And here is where you define the gap that you want to be created by the joint. So this same analysis is the same as the one before. There's the same rigid diaphragm, the same horizontal force, the same pushover analysis. What you see in the post processor when you run this, 
Mm, I will show you a new plot. Example 33. Is the gap is created in between the beams and the columns. So just for you to know, if you're using the offset, the gap will not be uh, where you want it to be. So maybe you will want to, in this case, define a different gap in, the, in different directions. Uh, but anyway, I would suggest that if you're studying the joint offset, uh, if you're studying a structure and you think that it will fail in the joint and you want to model that behavior inside of the joints, then probably using the offset is not the best idea. So I would advise you not to mix the two things. And uh, also to show you the results in terms of pushover of the same analysis, I'll go back into my folder. And read on to my monitor. As you can see here, my analysis failed much before. This I expected, because I expected uh, my joints to fail in shear as I gave them a different shear capacity than the rest of the structure. So, And as you can see here at the beginning, if I'm plotting, I don't want to see string though, I want to see stress. So I don't know if you guys can see the scales. Whenever I'm moving forward, this last structure is not taking as much, the columns aren't taking as much stress as the rest because things are happening in the joint. Um, so just to conclude also, this torsional behavior that I see more in the rigid diaphragm example, I think it's not due to the fact that my, my shells are more stiff than the, than the rigid diaphragm, because that would not be actually the, uh, the objective to have a flexible diaphragm, is to see the lack of stiffness. But I, I think it's because there's localized effect, so this cannot move as much, as you can see, there's also much difference in displacement as this one does. So if I would go forward with this channel, it's probably I will reach the same level of torsion for the same level of displacement. I will I will give you guys all of this for model. I ask you please to if you if you want to use them if you want to um, replicate them. Uh, I'm always welcome. I always welcome people that uh, correct my mistakes. So please do open them and check them out and see if there's something that can be improved and if we can spark a conversation on how uh, we can model these things better and in a more effective or easy way to also to approach and to, to learn. As for today, I'm done. Please let me know if you have any questions. I realized I was like in the computer, sorry. <laughs> Even if you expected like something different to learn about RC structures, maybe we can think about integrating the material. Hello, Francesca. Thank you very much for the nice presentation. Uh, I have a question maybe that you can help me is, is kind of related with what you did, but uh, I would like to to generate a contact element between a shell and a beam element, a linear beam element. Which yeah. element did you recommend me to use? So first thing, contact is a pain. <laughs> <laughs> yes. For you to know. Uh, I'm not sure, I, um, yeah, okay, I will try to show you something that I've done recently, but it's not here, it's on the other computer. Uh, I think, yeah. yes, what you can use, yeah. Estamos deshaciendo sus
just for you to see is that this, this building does not matter what it is. No, what happened? Sorry, I want to, I didn't want to copy, I want to move it. Move it, move it. Zoom on desktop is not really working so well. So. Okay. So what you can use is the element that Massimo developed, which is called zero land implex contact. And I'm not so sure if it's already out there or if he's gonna talk about it tomorrow. I think it's there, but uh, maybe he made some modifications on it. What you need to define is if you want the contact to be 3D or 2D, and you have some penalty values in reference to the normal direction of the contact, tangential direction of the contact, and uh, this is uh, friction. Yeah, I, didn't, I couldn't find the word in English. It's much better if you use the implex algorithm for the solution, but just remember you need very, very small steps to this to, to work. Otherwise, the inputs will not work. And you need to apply this to an interaction. So it's not something that you create as an element and then apply the contact to the element. So you apply the contact element to an interaction. And what you also need to remember is that this interaction has a direction. So for example, in this case, I want to join this line with this, with this two. Um, and so I had to create a local axis in both directions. So given the Z in this direction and Z in this direction, that will tell me that um, this beam was attached to this one, let's say, going inside and going inside on this other side. So they have opposite local axis applications. So just give the uh, right local axis application in the, the same direction in which you gave constraint and retain. And maybe you will need to do different interactions if you have more than one contact in the same model. So, so you use as element property the zero length? Inflex contact. Inflex contact. There's so many others also, but uh, this is the one that we use the most. Uh, I'm sure there's some, I'm not, this is the first model I did with contact and it was like, and then you use an interaction, you create an interaction in node to node interaction. Yes. Yeah. And, and, and then you you need to generate it to add it to this interaction. Just just the zero zero length. Yeah, you, yeah, you add it to the interaction. You add the zero length to the interaction. That's it. Okay. okay. And whatever you need as parameters, you add them inside here inside of the elements. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much, Frances. You're welcome. Uh, I will try it. Uh, just be careful with what you define to be, I don't know if you want to do it for infield panels or for something else, uh, but just be uh, careful what you, de what you define as master and what you, def what you define as constraint and what you define as retain, because the rule on how we create interaction in STKO is that, um, there can never be uh, like two retained nodes can never like be erased from the interaction. Like if you define ten retained nodes and three masters, uh, the retained node will all be added, but the master can also be ignored if they are found to be too far, and another master is closer. So, so what happens in, as as it happened before in the in the tree floor digit diaphragm? That the closer constraint node was on the top, so some of the uh, of the retained node just linked to that one instead of linking wow. to the master in the same plane. What happened to me here, for example, it was that I I first joined the the panel first and then the column second. Uh, so I I made the the constraint the panel and the retained the column, but then I did it on top and bottom, and so one of the two nodes of the infill panel was not connected because oh. it was a master and there was a retained, uh, there was a closer one which was on top. So I didn't need to have a duplicated one in the same spot. Yeah, so, it's tricky. Yeah, you just for you to be 
um, careful. Thank you. You're welcome. So I, in this case, either you do a lot of interactions, separated ones, or you change the directions of them and you know define a different way to, to create them. Thank you very much. Hello. That, that was a mothering thing in an RC frame, that model. It's to, to just to be completely honest, we abandoned the idea of doing that <laughs> analysis with that model for now. Like we will uh, maybe see it later on again. But um, yeah, just if you if you guys are more interested about infield, there's also another webinar than Massimo did just about infield. It was using some specific constructing open seas to do nonlinear mystery analysis in which you um, you can account for the fact this is called number 11 in field RC frame interaction with element remover. You can account for the fact that the infield could go out of plane during a nonlinear time history and so disappear in your analysis. Uh, this is not very much used, but it can be use, useful. And also uh, just for you guys to be careful because this is like uh, unit based, like you need to reference to specific units if you want to use it. And it's one of the few things in OpenTS that has been written. The code has been written with a reference to unit because the, the norm uh, was referencing uh, like some um, formulas in which you needed to have things in keep or inches, I don't remember what. So be careful with these kind of things. If you are going now straight ahead with your perfect unit system management that I'm sure you guys have, uh, in this case, you will need to think about it twice. Tell me. No one else has a question. I have a really easy question. Mm -hmm. uh, regarding the, the joints, the, mm -hmm. the force conquering joints, when I try to model some of them, uh, I, never, I never reached the point of the post-processor. So I wasn't able to see how they, because in the end, you put these, these dimensions, the L, X, Y, and Z. And then you actually see how it they work once you're in the post processor. So exactly, these these uh, three dimensions are from the center, mm -hmm. even on each side, or is like the middle, because these 400 millimeters you add were total, and the program centered it in the point. No, it's in each direction. In each direction, like imagine imagine that a, a joint is a point. That it has an orientation. Yes. So I would say it. I actually never uh, tested this. I don't know if it because I've always done joint which had the same uh, length in each direction. Yeah. <laughs> you should test it and see if it referenced the global direction or the local direction of the like the characteristic axis of. Uh, I don't know which one of I, I would say it's the global because uh, it wouldn't I wouldn't know no because if you if you follow the globe the local ones it's a mess because you have one going in one direction like yeah, the one element the and the other in the global direction you will have three uh, different length so it starts from zero if you, if you think about it it's it's just three beams coming out from a point so it's like a reference system. So it would not make any sense to align it in half because then you would go out of the joint area, let's say. Yeah, so the the, 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 the dimensions I give is like in one, I, I cannot put like negative direction, for example. But why would you want to do that? I don't know, I'm just... <laughs> no, no, no. No, no, no because no. I remember I have this problem and all the time I was saying like, I have the problem with this. Uh, then I remove Why the would you want to do that? This is your joint, no? Imagine yeah, but instead of, instead of the corner one, let's say you are this one in the middle, the other one. Yeah, but this is going to take, if you do 400 in this direction, you're going to do 400 here and 400 here. 
Yeah, but in the case that goes inside, same down, same. So I put I put the total, That's and like sorry, I put the what I want to go in one direction. So if I want to do four hundred, but two hundred on top and two hundred on the bottom, I put two hundred. Yeah. Let's verify the what I'm saying is correct. But I do believe it is. Whoa. Yeah, so you see the gap is always the same everywhere. Now you have the beam hanging, but the gap is the same in this direction. Uh, and you can see like this. So you have to turn off. So I think, um, let's see, like this beam is 300. Okay. So the, the, the size, so this is actually gapping 400 in this direction, 400 in this other direction, because it's larger than the beam. And, and the same it's doing in the vertical direction. I mean, this is five. I will, I will try once, once again. Because the, I was really frustrated because I wasn't able to like generate the joint properly. I think you should try giving different length in each. Yeah, no, it, it was with different length, and this is why because all the examples were with the same length, so I wasn't I never I was never sure like what I was representing there. Okay. Also, try reversing the direction of the beam if that changes something. Oh, to see if it changes. Okay. I will give another try. You are testing now. <laughs> Thank you. Okay. So I don't know if you guys have any other questions. Mm. Hi, Francesca. I have a quick question. Yes. Maybe you have answered this before, but I, I have been absent a few webinars. No problem. But I was wondering how about the interaction between the beam element and the shell element? Uh, since since you're making a pushover, it's a nonlinear analysis. Um, so, is first question, easy one: Is your shell element a nonlinear element? You, you're talking about the example I showed before. Yeah. Okay. So that in that case, uh, the idea was to go to that point to have a nonlinearity in. Uh, um up, up to the shell element but we stopped before like you can apply a nonlinear material to the shell element what we normally do is use the layer shell create for example a damage tc3d material that you can use in shells too and then you layer it in a layer shell so you will have fiber a response on fibers in that and that will be uh, on different levels and you can also uh, model the presence of reinforcement if you have any reinforcement in your in your panel. If it's not any, it's a shear wall, maybe. Uh, okay. But yeah, I mean, you can do that. You can do the contact. The contact is already a nonlinearity. Even if your um, whole structure is linear, that's already introducing something different uh, in the response uh, because something will have to change and shift for uh, uh, the infield to adjust to the new shape of the frame. And then you can add a nonlinear material for the beam and columns, and then you can add a nonlinear material for uh, the shell. You can also have nonlinear geometrical properties to both the beams and the shell. Okay, yeah, but for now your, your example was a, a linear shell. Yes, for now that example was, but you can do it. Okay, yeah, yeah, because there's always these uh, discussion about the how much the the diaphragm collaborates with the beam on the connection. So how we, I was wondering how could you model that? But uh, the shell has to be. Uh, you mean the shell that that it's in the diaphragm, not the yeah. shell in the infill. Okay. Yeah, I was meaning on diaphragm. Yeah, I mean. Um... I know that there's some people studying how viscous dampers uh, in the connection between the shell and the columns in the sense that 
um, it kind of gives uh, a viscous behavior of this kind of connection in the horizontal direction. But yeah, of course, what you can do is that, uh, for example, you have a, let's say, a structure which is just square. And instead of merging the shell with the rest of the structure, you can use a different kind of interaction to model this uh, contact and the way it interacts. Yes, you can try. It would be also a nice application. <laughs> a second quick question. <laughs> In, in inside the model, uh, when you apply the shell on on top of a let's say a force based displacement or force based element, uh, do do STKO um, subdivide the element? Don't you have convergence problems when you have like a small beam elements? Mm, it depends on how small, like if it's if yeah, it's, it depends on the mesh mesh size. But if I, if I, it depends if you like if you have a first beam column element and you apply like a standard integration scheme, you have to lower the number of gaps point if you're doing a very small beam. Because mm -hmm. if you want to have five and then it's gonna be really, really tiny. So for example, three is the minimum. So you you should you should try to get like a um let's say a trade-off in between how much you want to shell to be meshed and how much you want your your uh, beam element to converge. So yes, you can have. If you have very, very small force beam column elements, you will have problems. Okay. I had like uh, 500 millimeters, and that's still okay. Okay. Good to know. Thank you. Uh, the, another thing you can do is use the, it, it's been discussed by Massimo in one of the previous webinars, is use this interaction, not interaction, is an element called embed, embedding element or at the embed element, I don't remember the actual acronym. <laughs> um, mm -hmm. And that's, uh, that's can be used with a lot of applications, one of which is, let's say um, a main thing is to connect things with different mesh um, in, in a way that you don't need, you need to ensure compatibility of the mesh. What it does is uh, attaching each node to the other node, to the node of the other geometries, ensuring that in that area, they will have the same displacement and rotation and stress and strain will be transmitted to the to, to the elements. And this is done, um, I mean, the major application that we've done with it is solid beams with reinforcement. So we don't have to make holes in the solid to add the reinforcement, but we just model the reinforcement as a, as a beam column, another first beam column with fiber section. And we embed that in the solid elements there's a few things to be to take care of, but it works quite well. And of course, there's a penalty parameter to, to assign, which is also something that you need to uh, make attempts. Because what it, what you're doing is that you're saying how stiff is that connection? It's like how much rigidity am I giving to uh, that connection? So uh, you can also use that maybe for your uh, application with flexible diaphragm, even if that's not intended for giving a flexible connection. It's intended to give a rigid, uh, let's say one body connection. But it's anyway not as not perfect as it can be a merged geometry. Yeah, I'll check about it. It's interesting. There is like the webinar number is, I think, oh, Yeah, it's the last one that we had. 23. New element presentation embedding rebars into solid domains. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you for your question. If you want to follow the previous webinars, um, they're on the website. Oh, Guzan, your day has arrived. Yeah, so let me check the time. I don't know. 6 p.m. GMT plus two. Yes, it's also a 6 p.m. What, what, what's your time zone, Ozan? Is, is that comfortable for you? Sorry? No, no, I was talking to Ogozan. Okay. Uh, he's writing in the chat. He doesn't have a mic. Okay, so plus one hour. Yeah, okay, so we're, we must is gonna keep you company during dinner. Perfect. I'm sure you will have a lot of questions. So please do make them, ask them. 
or anybody else, uh, thank you for participating. I don't know if Antonio has any more questions. I think I answered Edgar's question. Some people already left us. Thank you, Augusta. Thank you for participating. I will see you guys next week from our uh, 19 class. And then the week after from our last class. We are going to miss you. Uh, me too, a lot. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Francesca, for everything. Thank you, Larissa. Uh, see you guys next week. Have a good evening. Ciao. Ciao.